Hey, everybody, welcome to Big Blend Radio's first Friday Toast to the Arts and Park show. And every first Friday, Nancy and I get the awesome privilege of interviewing artists in residence uh, who spend a full month in a national park unit. This is all through the National Parks Arts Foundation. And I mean, these are just incredible uh, opportunities for artists, musicians, writers, poets, singers, songwriters, filmmakers, you name it. If you're in the arts and you want to be in a national park unit, check out their website, nationalparksartsfoundation.org. And hey, you can donate to them too. All right. So today we're excited. We have award-winning freelance writer, journalist, and author Zoe Schlanger joining us. And uh, Zoe's work is incredible. I encourage you to go to her website at zoeschlanger.com. And that's S-C-H-L-A-N-G-E-R. You know, I have to prove that I can spell sometimes. Uh, but anyway, go to her website because you'll see all of this work she's done, uh, been on so many newscasts and she's been, you know, staff writer for Newsweek and uh, many awards and also writing her book that's coming out in 2023 through HarperCollins. It's called The Light Eaters. And she does a lot of work in regards to writing about plants and uh, ecosystems and people mm -hmm. in those ecosystems and the habitat. So very excited because today we're recording on our last day in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park yes. again. So welcome, yeah. Zoe. How are you doing? Thank you so much. I'm doing great. What a fabulous intro. I appreciate hey. that. There's, I had things written down, but I'm like, yeah, but you've done so much. <laughs> I ever go to your website. Because, I know. It's um, awesome. I was just, all these awards, but you seem <laughs> to do a lot of travel and work with a lot of different organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's cool that mm -hmm. you're uh, with the National Parks Arts Foundation. What got you inspired to even apply for the residency? Because I think there, it's interesting. We're getting a lot more plant people in Hawaii. <laughs> recently. Oh, that I mean, that makes total sense. I mean, I um, have been working on this book about plant behavior and mm -hmm. Hawaii is such an amazing place to think about that. Um, you know, it's absolutely near impossible that any plant ended up here at all. And so to come hmm. to a place where, you know, a single seed had to float across 10,000 miles of the Pacific to end up on an island and then create others and survive on like a rocky island and create other species, you look at every plant here and it feels like it's gone on this remarkable journey. And it, from a bi biological, like evolutionary hmm. standpoint, they created really bizarre really unique species that are now extremely threatened. So it was, it felt like it would be the best possible place I could go to go look at what it looks mm -hmm. like when plants are allowed to evolve without, essentially the species that end up here or ended up being made here um, are bizarre in part because they mostly don't have any defenses. There's, there was no mammals that ever made it to Hawaii except for a tiny little bat that like blew over in a windstorm um, somehow. Uh, <laughs> But when, you know, I, I'm, my book is a lot about how plants have adapted to their environments um, mm. and have learned to live with a lot of threats and have produced really complicated behaviors because of it. But in Hawaii, that's not the case. They got to do basically whatever they wanted. Um, so you have- It's island life, really man. unique species. <laughs> yeah, mm. exactly. Um, and that, so that's what made me want to apply here. I have had previously done a um, fellowship at the National Tropical Botanical Garden on Kauai. Um, they have an environmental journalism fellowship and that changed my life and got me wow. set on, I was covering climate change before and now I'm mostly covering plants and botany um, uh, thanks to them for the most part. So I want but to come back. But it's cool. so related. I mean, you can't talk about climate change without talking about plants. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially, yeah. yeah, losing species and Mm -hmm. watching species try and like climb uphill essentially to escape warmer temperatures at lower latitudes yeah all of those things absolutely true losing have you your been, pollinators have you been mm -hmm. to great basin national park i haven't yeah because of their, no. the, the trees there that's like they're ancient and how they change as they go up in the elevation and that's a mm. really good indicator of what's going on with climate change and at the same time we could mitigate climate change if we planted more trees i'm sure you know that's yeah. it's kind of this We've got to look at plants more. I know we've done so many radio shows on wildlife and conservation, and it's always, you know, beating the drum for the animals, which were 100% there. But mm -hmm. I always kept going, gosh, I'm telling you, we've got to look at the habitat. What, what's going on with yeah. the habitat? Because if the Absolutely. habitat and the vegetation is not there, then the animals are not going to survive. Um, right. You know, they have. It's true. There's also seems to be thievery in plants. Have you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually was just visiting the um, 
the seed bank and the group, the nursery here and talking to the botanists who work at the national, the volcanoes national park nursery. And um, the, the person, the botanist there showed me a little slide full of orchid spores. And this was the remaining, basically there's one of this orchid left in the wild. Oh. And these were the spores that they were trying to cultivate into plants to grow them out in the greenhouse and hopefully outplant them. And I asked her if like the location of that um, orchid, that last orchid was a secret. She's like, oh yeah, like the first thing they tell you when you come to work here is you have to turn your location services off on your phone. You are not oh. allowed to post to social media. It's like a very, you know, it's wow. when a plant is that rare, poaching is very serious. They apparently also just had a sandalwood tree poached from inside the park. Someone cut it down, <sighs> cut it into small enough pieces and shoved it under a fence. And uh, yeah, so absolutely. Thievery, wow. Plant poaching all over the place. I know in the West Coast, like in California and also in Utah and places like that, there's been a lot of um, succulent poaching, like mm -hmm. tiny, these like rare succulents are very highly prized in the black market. Yeah, definitely, the Encinitas, an Encinitas uh, Botanic oh Garden gosh. in San Diego, they, you know, they were a small botanic garden, but they made national headlines and actually, you know, they're actually thriving <laughs> because of this. Everybody knew about them being mm -hmm. in the backyard because oh, wow. somebody stole a barrel cactus that's very rare. Oh, and uh, so uh. this whole plant poaching thing becomes like, oh my gosh, there's thievery going on. And mm -hmm. when you think about like going to the national parks and seeing some of these plants, like even, you know, orchids, there's orchid thieves, you know, they're really, are, that's sure. a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then Everglades, when we're seeing, um, bromeliads up in the trees oh, just yeah, growing so wild I, I was like that's yeah so cool you know definitely so any specific plant species that you you met with <laughs> during your your month-long residency I mean that is so cool that you get a full month too <laughs> yeah definitely yeah um there's so many I mean there's some incredible ones I mean the main one to talk about here is the ohia tree which is the keystone species for particularly on the big island, but that's um, on all the Hawaiian islands. It's this incredible tree. It's the first thing to um, come out of lava fields. So uh, oh, wow. it's one of these things that has incredible roots that fissure the rock and create places for water to fall in. And you go out to these, you can hear, it's amazing. You can walk on dried lava lakes, just an alien landscape. And the so only cool. thing coming out are little ferns and then also mm. ohia lahua trees. Um, and they have these beautiful red spiky flowers um, and it features super heavily and you know it's really important for native Hawaiian culture and tradition um, and it's also this nurse plant so in a fully um, native forest I got to go actually walk into like a wet forest that is 100% native which is really rare here um, wow. it is just there's zillions of other plants growing on it as it's growing it's like the biggest wow. tree in the landscape and there's just it's just the bark is covered in all these kinds of ferns Ooh, and there's like lilies growing out of the branches oh and, wow you know huh. there's a species of the, the mint here doesn't have mint oil because it has because it dropped its defenses when it arrived here like I said before like huh. anything that serves to deter predators basically got dropped so there's all these like climbing <sighs> mints on it and it's just an incredible so the mint scent tree. is actually mm. out of like don't eat me absolutely yeah we're a oh. rare um animal that likes things like pepper or mint oil <laughs> or you know and, mustard oil these are all so if you start singing to your and you know how to sing singing to your mint, mint planet might actually say okay that's it if you like talk real nice to it and meditate with it it might just say that's it you know i'll be your friend i'm not gonna <laughs> you know give you mint oil but I, i'll be friends now and chill well, out <laughs> <laughs> no it's more oh. of an evolutionary time scale type okay. thing but um you know maybe over <laughs> generations if you protect but that's so mint. neat though when you they would have to create that. a new species but yeah. <laughs> but totally. When we lived in, in Kenya, we learned that what they classified as browsers in the mammal species were animals that would just take the tiny tip of a leaf and then move on and move on and move on. And so I thought, okay, well, that's because it wants to make sure that it doesn't eat the whole plant and then there's nothing to eat the next day. Hmm. But it, uh, we were told that the leaf at a certain point would emit either a really bitter taste or a smell. So the browser knows, oh, move on. 
so the mm -hmm. plant could protect itself. And you think, well, it's really hard to say, okay, well, that is a non-thinking living thing. So mm -hmm. I've always felt like plants have to have some sort of brains. Not everything's automatic defense. But then I know mm -hmm. science will say, no, it's automatic defense. And they were just made that way. And I don't know. I think they think. Mm. Yeah. You know? Well, this is, you've just touched on the biggest debate in mm. botany right now. I um, know. <laughs> that is, it is I really a thinking. <laughs> curious debate right now inside bot. And that's what this book I'm trying to write is about. It's fascinating. It's, I mean, mm. I think the most interesting thing about that conversation is in part, there is no definition for let's say consciousness is not a it's not a scientific there's no agreed upon definition right. for consciousness um neither for intelligence um and when it comes to plants they are doing certain things and we're more aware of them now than ever because of like advances in scientific instrumentation the genomics revolution everything you see plants um making choices like they mm -hmm. are reacting in real time to threats to um, you know, they're able to, to sense whether they're plant, many species can, can sense if they're planted beside their genetic kin or not, and then like adjust their behavior wow. accordingly, not to compete with them or to protect them. Um, wow. You know, there all these like learning behaviors, all of these things, but then, you know, most researchers are willing to only go so far when you're talking about that, which when you're talking about institu institutionalized science, it sort of makes sense. They're they're, the sciences are conservative when it comes to those things for a reason. They don't want to inflate something and then it turn out not to be true later on. Um, but it is where we're right at this tipping edge, I think, where those questions are being asked. Um, mm. is, it, is it right to think of plants as passive? Are they actually actively learning? Are they actually potentially thinking? How are they doing that if there isn't actually a brain organ, organ in the plant? Yeah. Um, this brings up conversations about like what a nervous system really is mm -hmm. as well. Plants are electrical beings, a lot like us, like there is electricity mm -hmm. streaming through them. Um, and so there's tons of papers now with titles like, should we update the definition of a nervous system to include something that doesn't have a brain, you know? Um, so yeah, it's fast. It's Sometimes fast. it's not just the brain is like being yeah. the, the head on your shoulders. It's part of being, mm -hmm. I mean, our brain, our, our brains are still in our cells. You know what I mean? We still have mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. bits. So I wonder about that in the right. plant, like if their brains are in a cell. Sure. Know? Well, yeah. yeah, there's all these different ways that it could be happening. And it's so outside of our ability to sort of conceptualize from a human centric point of view. I mean, you mentioned fungi before. It's also like mm. a case of like a distributed <laughs> network that is clearly making mm. choices and it's hard to determine whether or not that should be considered like is network intelligence the same mm. as regular intelligence is yeah it's so the first facebook endless. was uh, fungus yeah but have, <laughs> right. have you have you read the secret life of plants my favorite have you book. heard of that book i have and i pitched my book as a update to it um oh, oh, cool. okay. you know that book really yeah <laughs> did some damage like very serious yeah. damage to the field of botany um it actually oh. was responsible in part basically it was the first time you know 1973 mm. i believe like the yeah, first time popular culture was gripped with plant mm -hmm. like, like the topic of plants being intelligent beings became yeah like a phenomenon i mean stevie wonder like wrote an album about it um mm. The day of the triffids. The triffids. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, it sparked a total renaissance mm -hmm. in thinking about this in popular culture. And unfortunately, most of the book mm -hmm. was not able to be replicated scientifically. And it mm -hmm. really scared off a lot of people. I mean, in mm -hmm. the sciences from continuing uh, that work because they would be labeled as quacks or like, yeah. you know, um, the funding agencies that give funding, mm -hmm. like the, the national agency that gives funding to research became very um, skittish around giving any funding to anyone studying anything close to plant behavior for like 30 years. Um, oh, wow. So that's it's, a little much. in some ways huh. it is coming back now um, because some of the science is just, first of all, we're far enough away from the secret life of plants, but also some of the science is able to be so much more precise because of modern technology mm. that it's proving some things like 
that book is the reason people sing to their plants or like think that talking right. to their plants will help Talk them. to their plant, yeah. There's no evidence that that <laughs> is true. However, now, just recently, um, there's all this upwelling of research around plant acoustics and the fact mm. that they do respond to sounds. They don't respond mm -hmm. to like, there's no, no way to say that they like, like certain music more than others because music is not something they would have evolutionary had to be adapted to. But relevant sounds, like the sound of a bee buzzing, a flower produce sweeter nectar. You know, they something, are listening, they can hear. So, so it's, it's, like, it's the, like if it's a forest plant and you play forest noises, that it's going to perk up and go, ooh. But, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That's been studied, but, but that would be more ecologically relevant for sure. Well, but, what yeah, you're writing is going to be, I mean, that's hard, but it, you've got all this journalism background, right? Um, mm -hmm. So you've got that, okay, the facts, man, but to get it over to, it's so hard to, it's like history, history and science to get that to the general public to understand, to want to, I mean, it's necessary that we assimilate that information and, mm -hmm. you know, so that there is, you know, conservation protection and, and all of those great things, mm -hmm. but to get it out to the masses is a difficult thing to get sure. them to be interested and then learn it and get into it so yeah, yeah that do you do you, with all the work that you've done is that part of that learning thing in journalism is to how do I get them to be interested without with it's not being fake news as everybody keeps running yeah. around see that's the hard mm. thing what you're saying also with that book you know mm -hmm. see, I love the secret life of plants <laughs> I understand <laughs> why too. I mean I'd say I mean same if it if I didn't yeah. know the background I would wow feel really warm towards it but yeah I mean that that is exactly that's threading that needle of like not um sort of succumbing to being too unscientific while also like leaving room mm -hmm. for a sense of wonder and also mm. um acknowledging the many traditions of knowledge that exist outside of the sciences that do mm -hmm. acknowledge and have always acknowledged plants as sentient beings and persons so to speak I mean being in Hawaii has been a really wow. incredibly instructive thing in that sense um, mm. because everyone I've spoken to Hawaiian or not um, incorporate Hawaiian practices when doing their research and when you know um, every time I've walked into a research site in a forest here with a researcher before we walk in um, they sing a oli which is a as far as mm. I have learned so far a, a sort of a chant that incorporates elements of the landscape and lots of different layered meanings to sort of ask permission to come in mm. Um, mm. and acknowledge that they need to give something back for taking data and you know so there's a lot of like recognition of plant life as mm. you know people here use seem to often use personal pronouns for plants that they're not it it's a uh, yeah or they or they. he or she <laughs> or um yeah, absolutely. There's a lot well, of, there, of that. Well, there are male and female plants. Mm -hmm. I don't That's know true. that you could always tell when you buy a, <laughs> a couple plants from the nursery or something, you know, this is a male and that's female until if something happens reproductively. Like, sure. okay, yeah, then, then you go, oh, that's a boy and that's a girl. Mm -hmm. And you have yeah. to change your names, you know? Totally. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of plants also just switch their gender halfway through. See, you know, they alternate. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's like I'm tired of being this. I want to try that side now. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, this or is maybe that's a survival thing to make sure the plant can procreate and, and carry on no matter what. Yeah, especially in populations where there's very few of them right. left, like here. Um yeah. if you have I was well, speak a botanist on Kauai is someone who often has to hand pollinate very rare plants. And when it is separate male and females, they're basically doomed. Like you'd have to carry pollen from maybe the other side of the island to the last remaining, oh, wow. <laughs> from the last remaining male to the last remaining female. So it's much more in the interest of the plant to do both. That's why we have yeah. to take care of our hummingbirds and our bees. And, mm -hmm. you know, our pollinators are so important to our own, um, if we want food down the road yeah. we need to we need to stop all that insecticide stuff yeah uh -oh. totally <laughs> do you think totally. you, you know go, when we look at what's going on in um, Oregon and California with all the wildfires and mm -hmm. um, you know we we cover the sequoias like it's 
it's and there we were back there again this year and mm -hmm. you know just looking you know learning about fire management and you thinking about how you know now the fires are so much hotter i wonder if their production you know you fire used to be part of the natural way of even getting the seeds to sure. open up to open. Yeah. so i wonder yeah. now with these wildfires being so hot if it just scorches the seed and just burns them you know i wonder sure. about these natural changes well not they're not all natural um if that's yeah. going to affect the you know the propagation of these i'm diets. sure i mean I, mm -hmm. I wish i knew more about fire ecology it's becoming more and more of a relevant field oh, um yeah. even here i mean <clears throat> there are bot botanists or people who work for the national park here who have been sent to california now to do fire ecology mm -hmm. there in the midst of the fire um i guess when you reach a certain level of fire crisis like anyone who knows what they're doing gets flown to these fires um mm -hmm. uh yeah it's a really scary thing to watch i recently moved from brooklyn to Washington state and mm. just it's my first time I grew up in the east coast first time experiencing like smoke days and you know yeah being oh, aware wow. of like you can't take that highway because there's a fire on it um very new to me but really horrifying yeah, yeah. And you, hey you've got volcano stuff going on out there too like Mount Rainier <laughs> have you been to Mount Rainier yet I have not oh no, my <laughs> God, it is like you have to it go is, there That's it amazing. is pure magic I mean that you get I get giddy about plants like really like mm. like stupid giddy you know and <laughs> mount rainier like they say oh you're in paradise like and literally there's the biodiversity mm. of wildflowers are just it's amazing and wow. you think about you know mm. how you know it's volcanic again mm -hmm. you know and you think about mm. just the dramatic season changes that they go through up there sure. and then this beauty that comes out of it it's you just mm. like how did that happen you know so yeah. in Hawaii when you think about the volcanoes erupting and then plant life coming after that and we think about fire ecology I want to call it lava ecology definitely <laughs> you, know, you know there's like a whole other thing going on so while you were there I mean you were there for a month so it seems like you, I mean, I was wondering about that, about during COVID, everything's been kind of different. Some artists have been able to go and do workshops and programs. I don't know if you got to do that, but um, I'm glad to hear that you mm. did get to meet some researchers. Was that yeah. what your, your residency was like most of the time? Were, were, did you get a chance to write or are you really out in the field most of the time? Oh, definitely got a chance to write. Um, the COVID situation here is very bad. I was actually surprised I was still able to come um, oh, here. Wow. So well, they're at the worst they've ever I mean. been. Not yeah, definitely. About every, yeah. No, I'm glad. But so it was just outdoor walks with researchers um, at most. And everyone's very careful here. Um, very different situation than like, let's say New York, which looks like it's totally open. This is like very different here. Um, so no public programs, unfortunately. But um yeah, it's been mostly taking incredible hikes and talking to researchers and also trying to write. I mean, it's wonderful to be, um, I'm sure I mean, you have this experience all the time if you're moving around, like mm. your home environment can be the best thing in the world, but if you're seeing the same thing over and over again, it's really hard to have inspiration and new thoughts and mm. feel uh, aware, like your my sense of awareness of things and the sense that I'm constantly learning things and I'm in a new environment as opposed to my home environment is so stark and it definitely is so good for writing. I mean, hmm. I, at first, when I realized residencies as a concept existed, which was honestly not that long ago, I was like, hmm. wild, this is the one area in our society that like values creative time, literally mm -hmm. values it. Like mm -hmm. there's yeah. funding for it, there's space for it. Mm -hmm. um, there's this understanding that you need separateness from your home and also aloneness and also amazing environments to do the best work you can do I mean there's nothing else in society that thinks that way about art um, it, 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 you're I really right it, it's it's really interesting because you have to open your mind to different ways of looking at things for example I had an art professor who made us crawl on our hands and knees through a garden instead of walking <laughs> And then she turned around, okay, you walk through as a normal person, then you crawl through and you see things that you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. If you look up when you're hand, on your hands and knees, you see a whole bunch of insects that are under the leaves, not cool. on top. And when you're yeah. walking, now you see things that are on top of the leaves 
And then she's like, okay, now walk up. And then she had, she had us all hold the rope and walk looking up. So we wouldn't bump into things so that you could see what was going on above you so that you got more of an experience of everything that mm -hmm. the place had to offer. So it's kind of a thing, you know, like, um, you know, a lot of times I just want to get my hands and knees <laughs> you know, because there's so it's much the going on. Thing. I know. Yeah. Wouldn't it be warthogs? Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then it was uh, be blindfolded so you could smell, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and taste yeah, and taste things that you normally wouldn't taste. Nothing yeah. that would kill you so that you got this whole idea of what the world of she said like a little itty bitty place pieces that make this huge world observance yeah change yeah. of perspective it's great yeah, yeah. and yeah. that yeah. stimulates i think what you say is really mm -hmm. true about that stimulation because i know we're mm -hmm. in a different place all the time and recently we were um in georgia peach tree city there's lots of trees and lots of peaches but where <laughs> i where i was working and we were on deadline for the magazine and I write a lot of stuff in my head and then uh -huh. you start to put it on paper and you're like, come on, talk, talk to each other, hands, do it, <laughs> brain, do that, do oh, that yes. thing. Mm. But I just sat down early in the morning, looked mm. out and there's like, there's this forest and I'm upstairs looking down this far and I'm up by the mm. treetops and there's something mm -hmm. about treetops that rocks. There's hawks, there's yeah. owls, there's mm. deer coming through and I looked down and I'm like, all of a sudden I could just, there was like a flow of energy and I wonder about that. And Ooh. I was, and I think, you know, people always talk about, oh, magical. it's inspiring, but I think it is about that mm. newness that mm. there's like the magic of life yeah, when you're in the totally. right place. And I think yeah. what I've heard, you're in like the most amazing house too. It's a pretty cool house. Yeah. It's yeah, cool. There's a lot of balconies <laughs> and uh, oh, cool. it's, you can see the ocean very far away, but it's there and it's amazing. And I'm on still on West Coast time. So I see the sunrise every day. Um, oh, that's it's, cool. It's, it's pretty magical. Yeah. Yeah. What's up I with this East Coast stuff without, I'm used to four, well, I'm used to four in the morning <laughs> sunrise things from being in oh, the yeah. desert. And I'm like, uh -huh. I'm up. Where are you? <laughs> what is that's this? That's so funny. Like, it's still yeah. well, here, in the morning, here yeah. it's like, so um, the sunrise is around six and it goes down also around six. And I think it says that pretty much all year because we're, I'm not totally sure about this. I should check, but we're so near the equator and it yeah. also comes up mm. so fast and goes down so fast. Like sunset's like two seconds long. It's interesting. I don't, I, I oh. must be geographically where we are, but it's a very mm. jarring experience. Very different than what I'm used to. Wow. In Kenya, the sunrise and sunset was because it's on the equator. Uh -huh. Same time, every uh -huh. single day, no matter what the season. Every I single wow. day. No, if it it was kind changed. of weird, you know, it's like, well, we should be setting our clocks to the equator somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. So would you do another National Parks Arts Foundation residency? Oh, my God, yes. What I really hope cool. to. All the other ones, any of the other parks interest you, like Dry Tortugas? All, yeah. <laughs> All of them. Yeah. Well, Dry Tortugas looks absolutely incredible. Um, I know you have to go in a pair. Uh, mm -hmm. It does. It's so isolated. That scares yeah. me a little bit. Um, but my partner's also an environmental journalist. And so we've been thinking about applying as a pair. Oh, that's, um, that's so which cool. Which would be very cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, all of them. I would love to go to the the one at the National Park on Maui, um, just to see another, mm -hmm. I think every, what's amazing about being in Hawaii and having gone to, only gone to Kauai but prior to this, Kauai is the oldest island mm -hmm. geogra um, geologically. And Hawaii, the big island where I am now is the newest island and it's still being formed because it's still on the, volcanic hotspot so all the islands were created on this spot and then moved down a chain mm. basically so Kauai is the farthest away it was on the spot okay. last um mm. and now this is or first rather and now this island's still being formed so it's the geography the like landscape is totally different some of the plants are very different the feeling is different like everyone lives wow. with lava here Kauai it's like a distant memory like literally millions of years ago um that they were volcanic so it'd be amazing to see Maui, which is in between. Oh, that would be huh. good just to get that other balance. What about the desert Southwest? Are you looking at any of the plants in the deserts with what you're doing? I haven't yet. I would absolutely love to. I'm hoping to do a cross country trip um, in February and drive through New Mexico, Arizona, all of that. Yeah. See, they've um, got their desert Chaco. plants are amazing. The, yeah, they are. Oh, they're yeah. fascinating. Chaco, they've got Chaco, Chaco and they've got uh, Death Valley 
in February, Death That's Valley true. would be awesome too. Like, that yeah, would be really cool. We want to, we want to apply, but it's like it's so hard a, a full month, and then yeah, we can't. Uh, Tanya would but... know we we applied, and we probably wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you two enmeshed. I know, I but we do go to the though. parks as much as we can. As you, as awesome. we travel, we've managed to do like Gettysburg, um, mm. Chaco, and we did Fort Union. So we've managed to get out there, and it's interesting awesome. to me the connection i know you write about this a lot between the people the history and the nature so even mm. when you're going to a park like fort union that's very historic and about the different wars and the apache wars and uh, you know the santa mm -hmm. fe national uh, the santa fe trail you've got to realize the relationship with the people through the years with the plants with the animals and how you know a lot of the animals have their migration routes and so it's mm -hmm. this whole that's what's so cool about the parks to me is that you 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 may be going for the history, but you're going to come out knowing mm -hmm. nature, or you may be going for nature, yeah. but you need to know the, know the history too. Well, it's so connected, totally. mm -hmm. you know. You, yeah, you know the, the history is is created by the natural surroundings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah I really I, something. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say because you have to learn how to handle the nature that where you're living or visiting through and and it makes you change in order to survive which becomes history mm -hmm. yeah way. definitely mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah something i really appreciate about it. this park um and probably all the parks in hawaii all of the signs are both teaching you the species name and like things about the plant or that you know animal or wh mm -hmm. whatever it may be but they're also including the hawaiian name and the the use for that plant for mm, Hawaiians. Nice. So there's a, there's a nice. native club moss um, that in Hawaiian, the name means rat foot, I believe, or mouse foot. Rat and, <laughs> you know, and then there's this, cause it kind of looks like a paw. And then there's oh, a whole cool. description of how it was used for rheumatism um, or oh, is used cool. by Hawaiians. Nice. For Isn't that weird when you go back to how all these, you know, historic uses for plants like Native Americans have used this for soap or for this kind of illness. Mm -hmm. How did they mm -hmm. just go here? Let's try and chew on that and see, you know, and hopefully we won't yeah. die. I mean, you got to be careful, mm -hmm. like right now for those watching versus listening, you'll see we've got berries behind us. And if I was just walking by, I'd be like, "Ooh, it looks really pretty and looks juicy and like a, you know, it looks like a pink blueberry in a way. Mm -hmm. I just would eat that. But you could end up like, you know, the dude in the in the bus in, the, in Denali eating the wrong. Sure. Plant. You yeah, know what I mean? Totally. So it's like that whole research. Have you come across any writings of pe from people or any information on how they get to figure out what works and yeah. what doesn't? Um, I am not at all an expert on this, but I do know that, you know, cultures that were here thousands of years ago, I mean, if you have thousands of years to work on to where you mm. have to survive based on your environment and use your resources very carefully, and you also have all this time to be like really intimately aware of all of the plants around you, I'm sure a combination of things like watching what, what, uh, animals might eat or trial and error, honestly, mm. there must've been so much, but it has produced I mean, I'd say in any, you could probably look at any indigenous culture and see that they were intimately aware of like the, uh, the uses of basically every, like almost every plant has a use um, mm -hmm. for people. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's oftentimes now also being confirmed by, um, you know, so to speak, Western science. There's a, you know, most of our pharmacological compounds come from plants and mm -hmm. oftentimes they're plants that were being already used by the population that had always been there um mm -hmm. probably for a very similar thing which is really mm -hmm. amazing yeah. um like ayurveda, like ayurveda we were seeing more and more of that being talked about you know the different you know the different herbs that are used in cooking and um, just, you know, medicinal use and just even mm -hmm. daily care, mm -hmm. how Ayurveda, I mean, that was, that, that was one of the most ancient forms of medicine back in the day, mm -hmm. you know, I think with the very sure. first of healing and um, we see it now more in the West, more and more, which is exciting. I think it just mm -hmm. opens the doors and I'm seeing more of integrative health and the West and the East meeting on, okay, you know, yeah. you can look at what the ancient people did and not just scratch it off, you know, something oh, came definitely. from somewhere. I know we were talking before 
um, you came on that, you know, it's like what bacteria is a good thing, you know, it's like, and here we oh, are yeah. in our houses putting Clorox on everything, but you know, sure. <laughs> you mm -hmm, know it's totally. kind of weird that full circle, but tell everybody what those berries are. They are, I wish I had the Hawaiian name in front of me. I don't remember it, but they are the native huckleberry relatives. So basically a huckleberry um, mm. species floated on the ocean or came over on a bird's belly in, inside a bird's belly like yeah. millions yeah. of years ago. And the seed managed to survive and managed to speciate, like create new species. And this is one of them. Um, those are edible. People make jams out of them. Um, mm. They are not that juicy actually. Um, most interestingly, mm. like the, the juiciest, sweetest fruits and everything are not gonna be native to Hawaii because that just of the, the way that evolution worked here. Like it didn't maybe need to try that hard to get, you know, there wasn't that many birds that uh, the birds didn't have that many options. They didn't have to try to be so, so, so sweet to outcompete other fruits. So that's why they're kind of, everything's milder in flavor. Um, but yeah, it's a native huckleberry. So this it's is interesting good. when you talk about like the, cool. you know, the plants like, oh, this is my kin, so we don't need to compete for things. We're going to work together, that kind mm -hmm. of, you know, science. And right now, you, you know, even in certain parks, you need to brush off your hiking boots and even watch yeah. what you're bringing yeah. in with your backpack because of invasive species. Totally. So we're looking at that, but something comes from somewhere. Maybe it came on a boat or a ship or it was mm -hmm. an ancient or evolution. Bird. So. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, it's like, were the invasives now that we're pulling out, were they supposed to come out and take out those plants? I mean, is this like a whole other war, <laughs> plant war, mm. in well, a way? that's you know one way I mean? to look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it certainly is. I, I think, um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. It's like, who who has the right to be here? Um, that said, <laughs> the, the ones that arrived so long ago are like so specifically adapted to yeah. live in like this delicate balance in the environment here. Whereas mm -hmm. like there are plants that have been imported mostly as like ornamentals. There's this beautiful ginger plant that's all over, all over the place called Kahili ginger. It came from the Himalayas. It's got beautiful yellow flowers, absolutely stunning plant. So aggressively invasive. It just goes in and takes out, it fills mm -hmm. up the understory so that no other plant, it like chokes out all other plants. So nothing wow. else grows basically yeah. and all these little native plants that never had to deal with like rapidly growing fast shading plants like have no chance and so actually one day when I was here I went out with a volunteer group to cut kahili ginger and you know I thought it was such a beautiful plant but your relationship changes to it so much when you realize it's like suppressing these plants like that the have murder like plant. evolved in a very different way yeah exactly and so yeah. actually something I'd, I'd like to write about you know, I'm also a freelance reporter. I'm still writing other stories besides this book is the ways that um, there's a big conversation around how to ethically travel to Hawaii. I mean, mm -hmm. the tourism industry here is huge and there's been a lot of conversation, especially during COVID, like, is it ethical to come here? And probably not mm -hmm. at the best time to be a tourist in Hawaii, of course, but there's such a strong concept of, you know, you talked about these researchers going to the forest and like giving something back in order to take their data, like whether mm. it's a chant or something. And that's mm. just pervasive here that you don't enter somewhere without permission. You don't take something without giving back. And tourists can come here and do some of this invasive species work. And it's very, very fun. And like, I'd love to write about how they could get hooked up oh, with nice. these groups who do this because it's such a satisfying feeling realizing you can like we cleared it was a group of like eight people and we went out for maybe three hours and we cleared a really huge area of kahili nice. ginger just lopping it off with clippers very satisfying to cut very easy and in the underneath you could see baby native plants that were like waiting they're like hey, their got sunshine. Some That's sunlight. sunshine exactly yeah. and then oh, they took cool. us to a different forest where they had been doing this ginger cutting for a long time and it was totally different and you saw mm. the native plants coming back so i think that's, that's awesome something people would love to do if they have the opportunity and it feels really good to do that's, that's awesome awesome i think the, mm. i mean we've done I like a lot that. i mean majority of our life is like awareness awareness and doing and mm -hmm. when you do travel and get involved versus the typical you can have your typical things that you want to do but when you give back you really get to you got to get dirt on your fingernails you really do mm -hmm. because you start to understand 
it's like even like how we travel with pet sitting or mm -hmm. whatever you are actually in someone's garden and you're weeding or taking out things and you're like i didn't yeah. even mm -hmm. know this plant existed now you've got this whole other level of understanding and there is a whole movement called trans transformative uh travel that is going hmm. on and we just did an interview uh, with sherry wyatt she's um a part of the whitby kameno islands in washington and oh, it's yeah. all coming cool. out of Seattle, by the way, <laughs> just nice. saying, and there's a trying to get people to travel. It's about responsible tourism, mm -hmm. but it's beyond, um, don't throw your stop. I mean, our tour started with a kid throwing a soda can and on the Ahinga trail in Everglades, and it's yeah. sitting there amongst a bunch of gators. Now who's going to get that? Mm -hmm. And the parent right. not telling the kid to didn't do anything, you know? Right. So there's, we, we still have those basics to mm -hmm. learn, but I sometimes I think you do need to be the one cleaning up the cans to understand never to do it again. I'm not saying throw the kid sure. in there with the gators, but you know, I just at that yeah. moment I felt like it. <laughs> but, you know, I'm in two minds. Sorry, <laughs> you know, but um, but if we have these volunteer, um, that is transformative. If we are actually doing, then mm -hmm. we will understand our behaviors and be able mm -hmm. to adjust accordingly. You know, and yeah, I think totally. that that's a whole. Well, that's cool. Well, I can't wait. I've got you do mm -hmm. on Twitter. I know you do all on Twitter and Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, definitely. Um, well, mostly just your... Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, us too. So I'm going to be watching. I can't wait to to keep following what you're doing and anything you do with NPAF. Are you doing any uh, specific stories uh, from your experience? Um, well, mostly this experience will end up in the book, I imagine. Cool. Um, but also, hopefully, stories. We'll see. Awesome. We'll see awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, cool. listen, please come back when your book is out. I can't wait to read it. That's totally. mm -hmm. I geek out oh, on that you. stuff. I love it. But you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm still now bummed about the secret life of plants because I love that book. It's one <laughs> of the only books I kept in our storage unit was that book. Aww. It's like my favorite. We've got a few, you know, that are, are experts on, on the blend, but well, it made people it. love plants and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's well, what yeah, got I, me is about the meditation did. over the leaves and how the plant could survive if it had that connection activity so are you going to tell me that that's don't don't it is not <laughs> replicable they were unable to replicate mm. that um so i need but, to stop you know there's a world there's now. a world in which like years from now we may uh, have technology that's able to mm, create a study that would actually be able to measure that um i, I think but, it's a it's an open your mind book yeah. So maybe there was a little fibbing, a little exaggeration here and there by the authors who just wanted us to open our mind a little bit and not think that we should be destroying everything we touch. Hey, sure. Yeah, exactly. and that's a good thing. Well, I'm glad you're mm -hmm. doing a follow up on this. This is awesome. <laughs> Everyone, uh, yeah. keep up with Zoe. She is zoeschlanger.com. And also for the National Parks Arts mm -hmm. Foundation, they totally rock. Go to nationalparksartsfoundation.org. I should just say dot, they rock. You know? um, <laughs> but, and also keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Again, we interview artists every first Friday. And our shows air Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to talk to you guys. You too.